few years ago, I, I read um, about the extraordinary impact of Jesus uh, in a book by John Ortberg, and it's called, Who Is This Man? Um, how many of you have read that? Just a, yeah, just a few of you. Um, what it does is it, is it charts the amazing historical impact of Jesus on culture. And it was stuff that I had never really stopped to consider. And to me, it was, it was mind-blowing stuff. Was when you think about it, this peasant from a no-name town somehow started a movement, a revolution, that has forever changed the way we think. And I'm not just talking about Christians. Okay, I'm talking about whole societies, the things that we value, the things that we, that we protect, the things that we defend. He had the most devoted little group of followers, and they were deeply marked by his life and his teaching. And that little group pioneered a different way of thinking. And in time, it changed kings and empires and civilizations. And Jesus predicted that this would be the case. One day, Jesus was standing with his disciples outside of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples this huge question. And you have to imagine like being one of them, and when Jesus asks a question, it's like, you don't want to mess this up. But he says, who do people say I am? And so they say, well, a lot of people say that you're like some reincarnated person. You know, the Old Testament prophet Elijah, maybe John the Baptist. There's, there's all kinds of theories about who you are, Jesus. And so Jesus says, okay, well, well, what about you guys? Okay, who do you say I am? And, and Peter steps out and says, you are the Messiah, the Christ, the Holy One that was promised. Okay, you are the Son of the living God. And Jesus looks at Peter and says, you're right. You didn't come up with that on your own. That idea was given you from, from above. And then Jesus said, from now on, I'm not, I'm not calling you Simon. I'm calling you Peter, which means rock. Because on this rock, I'm going to build a congregation. Okay, I'm going to build an assembly. I'm going to build a gathering of people. And, and my death, and then he would look around at his disciples and he would say, and your death isn't going to stop it. Jesus promised that he would build an assembly, a congregation, a people, a movement. Okay, what, what many translations call, call a church. And today, like, like every Sunday, millions and millions are gathered, okay, are assembled to, to honor and to follow this man, Jesus. When you think about that, that's kind of wild. It means that you and I being gathered here today is the fulfillment of a 2,000-year-old prophecy, which is pretty remarkable. And it's remarkable, really, when you stop and look at it, that the movement of Jesus ever survived. Because you think about it, Jesus died an outlaw, and all of his first followers were outlaws, and they were up against powerful opposition, and somehow it all survived. And Jesus was right. But the goal for Jesus was never that people would just gather in his name. His goal for his followers is that they would become what he called salt and light. That in his power, his people would go out and change the world. In a, in a world ruled by the kingdom of Rome, okay, ruled by men like Caesar and Herod, Jesus proclaimed the unstoppable power of a new kingdom. He insisted that this kingdom had become present on earth and that anyone, okay, anyone at all, could be a part of it and that it would last forever. He claimed that this kingdom had arrived somehow through him, that it was present on earth because he was present on earth but that it would, it would eventually be bestowed on his followers, okay, on his gathering, on his assembly, on those that, that look to him and trust him, that he would continue his work on earth through them. And guys, as we know, just from a matter of historical perspective, that's exactly what happened. The influence of Jesus has exceeded the influence of anyone ever. 
No person's teaching or life has imprinted the world like Jesus. Like our culture, our, our values, our, our government systems, our priorities have been so deeply touched by Jesus that it is, it's staggering. And not just the values, okay, I'm not just talking about the values of church people. I'm talking about the entire societies where those people live. I'm talking about Republicans and Democrats. I'm talking about religious people and non-religious people. I'm talking about Europe, North America, Australia, Africa, Asia, South America. No one has left a deeper imprint on the world than Jesus. But his, his influence really can go unnoticed, and it often does. We can wrongly assume that the way that we think about the world is the way that people have always thought about the world. But the thinking and teaching of Jesus is really at the core of so much of what we value. Again, I'm not just talking about Christians. I'm talking about our entire culture. Now, Orberg points to all kinds of realms that Jesus has impacted. And uh, I hope that those of you that haven't read that book, I hope you read it. And I hope you have your mind blown um, the way that I did. Today, I just want to focus on one realm that Jesus has touched. Okay, I want to focus on the realm of human dignity. One of the most sacred creeds of our nation is this. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Everyone matters. Everyone has value. Like, we really believe this, don't we? We really believe this. And this is why when, um, if you remember Donald Sterling, how many of you remember Donald Sterling, this story with him? Former owner of the LA Clippers made some outrageous racist comments a couple of years ago. And our nation went into an immediate frenzy calling for swift and severe punishment. Okay, somebody's got to take action. And this is why most people cheered when, uh, and celebrated when the NBA commissioner, Adam Silver, fined Sterling the maximum amount, $2.5 million, and banned him for life from the NBA. People applauded that. People cheered. People went crazy. Like, yes, why? Because we don't tolerate that stuff. Okay? We truly believe everyone matters. Everyone is endowed with certain unalienable rights. A few years ago, our, our family took in a 16-year-old boy named David. And unfortunately, this isn't quite the way we drew it up, but he only lived with us for a couple of months. Um, going into this thing, we set some boundaries, and he chose to consistently violate them. And so he ended up deciding to move out. Now, we're still on very good terms with him. Um, we're still in touch with him, and, um, and we're doing everything that we can to love him and include him. And he will actually spend holidays with us on occasion, every, every once in a while, like Christmas or something, which has been really cool. Um, we're in his corner, and he knows that. But that's, in having David live with us, one of the things that became obvious is, is how the state system works. Now, it is a flawed system. If you've ever been involved with it, it's a flawed system in many ways. It's, it's not always efficient, and, and money doesn't always go to the places that it should or, or be used in ways that it's supposed to. But you would not believe, you would not believe the amount of resources that are leveraged toward kids that are in the system. You would not believe the resources that kids get poured into them. And that is not at all a complaint. That's not a complaint. In fact, it's, it's exactly the opposite. Resources are not always well used, but it is undeniable that in our society, we value kids. Okay, we value orphans. We value people that have no one to love them or protect them or guide them. We value them enough to invest tons and tons of tax dollars. Why? Because we really believe everyone matters. Everyone is endowed with certain unalienable rights. And that, my friends, is a beautiful thing. Now, I know that there are still racists and child abusers and horrible people. 
I know that not everyone believes or, or believes perfectly that everyone matters. Not everybody treats people with dignity and respect. Okay, we all know that there's still prejudice and there's still hatred and there's, there's all kinds of junk. We, we know that there's still a lot of work to do. But as a whole, our society truly holds human dignity sacred. We do. And if we don't give this some serious thought, we can just sort of assume, well, everyone has always thought this way. But we would be so wrong. We would be so, so wrong. This was not how people thought in the ancient world. In in the ancient world, and let me just describe the ancient world for you. In the ancient world, all peoples had gods. Okay, Zeus, Apollos, and, and you could go on with multitudes. And their gods had different names, but what they shared was a hierarchical way of ordering life. Okay, at the top of creation were the gods. Under them was the king, just slightly under them. Under, under him were the, the members of the king's court and then the priests who reported to the king. Below them, just a little below them, were the artisans and the merchants and the craftspeople. And below them was a very large group of peasants and slaves, okay, the dregs of humanity. And the reality is most people fell in that category. The king was thought to be divine, or at least like semi-divine. The the king was understood to be made in the image of God, but only the king was made in the image of God. This is what separated the king from everybody else. This this was the dignity gap, and the farther down the, the ladder, the wider the gap. So imagine, then, what it did to the hearts of peasants and slaves. Imagine how it went over with the dregs of humanity when this peasant rabbi insisted again and again and just kept insisting over and over. Everyone has been created in the image of God. Hear me, everyone has been created in the image of God. Male and female, rich and poor, royalty and slaves. Everyone has worth, Jesus would say. Everyone matters. There may be different levels of of talent or strength or intelligence or beauty. When it comes to that stuff, there there are what we might call gradations. But as Martin Luther King Jr. once said, there are no gradations of the image of God. And as a culture, as a society, we believe this. But not everyone always has. The, the idea of the equality of all human beings was apparently not self-evident in the ancient world. Aristotle, for instance, didn't believe that all men were created equal. And he actually wrote that inequality, okay, masters and slaves, was the natural order of things. Aristotle, okay, who lived more than 300 years before Jesus, wrote this, He said, for that some should rule and others be ruled is a thing not only necessary, but expedient. From the hour of their birth, some are marked out for subjugation, others for rule. From the hour of their birth, some are marked out for subjugation, others for rule. That's just how it is, right? You think, who came in between Aristotle and Thomas Jefferson, who penned the Declaration of Independence? Like, how did our society somehow come to value all people? In the ancient world, the the devaluing of people led to, to all kinds of brutal customs. Unwanted children were left to die. It was a practice called, does anybody know? It It was called exposure. And it was legally protected by Roman law, okay? The practice of exposure was legally protected. You think about that. Abandoned children were usually left, okay, in a dump or on a dunghill. And and, and ancient Roman law said that a boy who was, as it called, strikingly deformed, whatever that is, had to be disposed of quickly. The one archaeological dig found the bones of 100 babies apparently murdered and thrown into a sewer. Now, into that world, 
Jesus came and said things about children that nobody said. One day Jesus was asked a deep theological question. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And his, his, here's his response. Who's the greatest in the kingdom? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Guys, children had no value in the ancient world. They were weak and helpless. They were useless. They were, they were pushed aside. They were expected to be silent. One time Jesus is teaching and we're told that uh, people were bringing children to him. And, and the disciples, they scolded the parents. Like, like, get these kids out of here. And Jesus turned around and he rebuked the disciples. Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. A kingdom for children. And this was before Walt Disney. I mean, after his death and resurrection, as the movement of Jesus spread, it created an alternative community that began to honor and defend and protect children. When followers of Jesus began to assemble, they very quickly rejected the common practice of exposure. In fact, because the average life expectancy in their world was only about 30 or so, as you can imagine, there were orphans everywhere. And for the first time in history, this new community began to collect money to care for them. Eventually, at, at baptism, children would receive what were called godparents. Okay, people who promised to care for them if their parents passed away. In the 4th century, a Christian Roman emperor, get your mind around that, a Christian Roman emperor. What a, what a mind-blowing thing. A Christian Roman emperor outlawed exposure in Rome. It became illegal and was banned throughout the entire empire. And over time, instead of leaving unwanted children in garbage dumps, people decided, hey, maybe we should leave them outside of monastic communities or cathedrals where Christians gather or outside of churches. And the beginnings of what would be known as orphanages began to rise. Okay, usually associated with monasteries, cathedrals, churches. I, I've been thinking a little bit about how, how much we value kids in our culture. I, I think people in the ancient world would have their minds blown. The way we treat kids, the way that we value them, the way that we can order our lives around them. Um, a couple of years ago, our, our family... Uh, coached some basketball. So Jen and I, and then um, along with Kate and Cam at the time. So we took a little team at the YMCA. Which is, if some of you look at that, go, that was two years ago? Cam looks like one of them. <laughs> My goodness. But it was awesome. We would, uh, you know, we had, we had the kids and we could break them into little stations, the four of us, and kind of send them around. Some would be doing ball handling, some would be doing shooting, some would be doing defense and all that. It was really fun. And we, we decided we would do this together. We signed Brooklyn up for it and we decided the four of us would coach. And so Jen said, hey, well, maybe we should just, like, I should invite people. So she put, it, put a little announcement on Facebook and she just invited anybody that wanted to to sign up. And we ended up with, in our little team, in Muckleteo, we ended up with six Brookview kids. And uh, we've actually got some pretty sweet action shots from those days. This is good stuff. So there's, we got Brennan Beach, and uh, he's, uh, he's going to attack the basket right there. He was, he was awesome. Man, he was fired up. Yes, coach. Uh, okay, next slide. Little Gavriloff. We used to do this, you can't really tell right there, but he was a monster. <laughs> we used to do this like little rebounding drill where the, the kids would just kind of put two or three of them around the hoop and just throw the ball at the basket and say, go get it. And teach them how to box out, teach them how to be aggressive, go get loose balls. Man, he was an animal in that drill, just ferocious. Uh, okay, next one. This is Caleb Coates, and um, he's going to take a shot right there. I bet he made that. 
So you had really good coaches. Uh, <laughs> that kid right there, is he, he could literally shoot the ball like in first grade from half court. Have you seen the guns on that kid? He's just unreal. Okay, next one. Yeah. <laughs> sort of a little Jordan impression. And I can't really remember. I'm, I'm almost certain she scored on this play because what kind of defense is that kid playing? <laughs> oh my gosh. But he looked good for the photo, didn't he? Okay, next, next one. Got Jaden. And Jaden, man, if you haven't been around, that little kid is, is so fast. He's just, man, that kid can, can get after it. Uh, we've got next one of him. You can see right there he's dribbling, except it's kind of hard to see him. He's blurry. Because <laughs> he's like lightning, baby. Okay, next one. When we, when we first got, when Jaden first came to us, he was like so excited to play and everything, but he was kind of timid because he didn't really know what to do and just kind of nervous about everything. But after the season went on, he got super aggressive. So here he is wrestling the ball with this other kid. Now, before we go to the next slide, how many of you think Jaden won the ball on this play? Okay, next slide. Yeah, Jaden. Yeah, baby. Uh, and then... I don't know what happened. Something clicked in that last game. These kids are, you know, first grade, kindergarten, first grade. is co-ed. And somehow that kid, he had five buckets in the final game. He had 10 points in the last game. Most teams don't even score that much a whole game, but just the whole team. Uh, we've got one more of him driving to the hoop. It's pretty sweet. Yeah. But here's what, a, what staggered me about the whole experience was not only did we coach it and, and love it, and was it, I mean, it truly was one of, the, one of the coolest things we've done as a family. It was so fun. But uh, for several of our games, the gym would be packed with all these people that came to watch these kids. And we've got one more slide of, of one of, and this, like this must have been a timeout or something because people don't look riveted. <laughs> but, but it, and it's probably hard for you to see, but if you look around there, okay, you've got Tony and Rebecca, Elrick, they don't have a kid on the team. You look at the Cloyds are there, they don't have a kid on the team. You, you know, you look around the room there, there's Sean and Haley, they don't have a kid on the team. Here's all these people coming to watch kindergartners and, and first graders play basketball. And then the grandparents and the whole, I mean, the gyms would be packed. And the energy in there when things were going was unbelievable. Um, and and, and here's, here's where I'm going with this. You think about, like, why in the world would all of these people come to watch little kids play basketball? And I can guarantee you it was not because the hoops were high quality. <laughs> Here's why it is. It's because we believe kids matter. We value children. We show up at soccer games and dance recitals. We, we show up at their schools to help with field trips. We want them to know, okay, you matter to me. We want them to know and just feel in the core of who they are. You are precious. You matter to me. And guys, this is not the way people have always thought about kids. Okay, in the ancient world, there, there were no YMCA basketball leagues for kids. There were no dance studios. There were no soccer clubs, no little league, no campfire girls. There was no raising of money for kids' programs. Okay, there was no Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts like Think about it. There were no Thin Mints or Samoas or Caramel Delights. <laughs> In Jesus' day, nobody gathered en masse at the, YMCA, at the YMCA to honor and celebrate kids playing basketball badly. You know why? And, and I'm sure there were many factors, but here's the big one. They didn't see kids the way that we do. John Orberg writes this. He says, There were many clubs and associations in the ancient world. None of the qualities associated with children, okay, weakness, helplessness, lowliness, qualified one to join any of them. There were no clubs for children until Jesus. Guys, Jesus changed the way people think about people. The intrinsic value of every person has apparently not always been self-evident. And it's not just children. It's anyone with a weakness of any kind. In the ancient world, 
people would just be cast aside like garbage. But the followers of Jesus took his sayings as sacred. Things like, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Or look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Or are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your Father's care. Even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Now, the point here isn't that God doesn't value sheep or sparrows. He values them more than we can possibly comprehend. He feeds the birds. He gives them trees and and twigs for nests. He gives them other birds to be in community with. God, God cares. But Jesus says God cares even more about you. When you care about someone, you notice the details about them. Like like when a baby is born, most parents, they literally count the fingers and toes. And if one is missing, they notice. You think about it, like even mediocre parents do this. And Jesus was saying, "God, God cares about you so much that he even... Numbers the hairs on your head. He notices their quantity. He mourns with you when they go away. (laughs) God cares about people, even the details. He cares deeply. He cares passionately. Every life is of immense value. And and the community of Jesus' earliest followers believed that, and they lived it. During the reign of of Emperor Marcus Aurelius, how many of you have ever heard of Marcus Aurelius? Around 165 AD, an epidemic of what may have been smallpox killed a third to a fourth of the population, including Marcus Aurelius himself. Less than a a century later came a second epidemic, and at its worst, 5,000 people were dying a day, try to fathom that, 5,000 people were were dying a day in the city of Rome alone. For the most part, people in the empire, of course, responded in panic. There was no guidance in the writings of Homer. Okay, no commands from the Greek god Zeus to risk your life caring for the dying. One Greek historian wrote about a similar plague in Athens. He says they died with no one to look after them. The bodies of the sick were heaped up one on top of the other. At the first onset of the disease, they pushed the sufferers away and fled from their dearest, throwing them into the roads before they were dead and treated unburied corpses as dirt, hoping thereby to avert the spread and contagion of the fatal disease. But in Rome... There was a small but quickly growing community, a gathering that followed a a man who touched lepers, who told his disciples to go and heal the sick. And here's an ancient description of their response to the plague in Rome. Heedless of the danger, they took charge of the sick, attending to their every need and ministering to them in Christ. And with them departed this life serenely happy. For they were infected by others with the disease, drawing on themselves the sickness of their neighbors and cheerfully accepting their pains. Apparently, they they took the words of Jesus very seriously. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. 
In the earliest centuries of the church, leprosy was the worst of diseases. It meant isolation, suffering, and eventual death. But a, a church father named Basil had an idea. They said, what if, what, if, what if we build a place to like gather and then love and care for lepers? They don't have money? Like, no problem. They don't even have to pay for it, okay? We'll go out and we'll raise the money on their behalf. One of the most famous sermons in that century was by his brother, a guy named Gregory of Nyssa, to raise money for the cause of leprosy. And this is, this is what Gregory preached, the words of his sermon. He says, lepers have been made in the image of God. What? Yeah, lepers have been made in the image of God in the same way you and I have and perhaps preserved that image better than we. Let us take care of Christ while there is still time. Let us minister to Christ's needs. Let us give Christ nourishment. Let us clothe Christ. Let us gather Christ in. Let us show honor to Christ. And that was the beginning of what would come to be known as hospitals. Soon it was decreed that every cathedral also needed a hospice, a place of caring for the sick and the poor. Now you think about that. Where does the idea of gathering the sick come from? Where does the idea of raising money in order to provide care for them come from? It came right out of the movement of Jesus. And this is why even today, many hospitals have names like Good Samaritan or Good Shepherd or St. Anthony. Uh, my two oldest, Kate and Cam, were both born in Bellingham at St. Joseph's. Can you imagine a world with no hospitals? Guys, there once was such a world. But a man entered that world and he taught people to love. And out of that love sprang hospitals. And organizations delivering compassion of all kind, all kinds. Another follower of Jesus named Jean Henry Dumont cringed at the sound of wounded soldiers crying out on the battlefield. So the Swiss philanthropist developed uh, or devoted his life to helping them. And it led to an organization that's now known as the Red Cross. So like every time you see the Red Cross in action, in essence, whether the people serving or not are followers of Jesus, it is the thumbprint of Jesus. This is also true of the Salvation Army, of World Vision, of the YMCA. It's true of Samaritan's Purse and Compassion International. I mean, all of these have sprung out of the movement of Jesus. Now, I am not saying by any means that Christians have the market cornered on compassion. I mean, not at all. Some of, uh, of the most compassionate people that I know are not followers of Jesus in the slightest. But my question is, how did compassion become so popular? Why is our society, both Christian and non-Christian, so unwaveringly devoted to caring for those in need? The greatest minds and teachers before Jesus did not think this way. How did the world transform from the thoughts of Aristotle, who said from the, the hour of their birth, some are marked out for subjugation and others for rule, to thoughts like this. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Who came in between Aristotle and Thomas Jefferson? How did our society come to value what we value? And here's the incredible thing about the one we follow. Jesus paid attention to the people that no one paid attention to. He announced the availability of a kingdom different from the kingdom of, of Caesar or the kingdom of Herod. A kingdom where blessing, where the, the full value and, 
and worth of God would be conferred upon the poor in spirit and, and the meek. Now, people did not understand fully what this meant. And the truth is, we still don't. But what's clear is this. Jesus has painted a new vision for how valuable people are. And he's inviting you and me to embrace it and to learn to live in it.